Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the last lecture of the day for the Northeast Georgia Trauma Symposium. I'm so sorry I can't be with you in, in person, but I'm very happy to share some information with you, and I hope that you will enjoy it. My name is Barbara McLean, and I'm a critical care program specialist for the Emergency Service Line and the Cardiovascular Critical Care Service Line at Grady Memorial Hospital. And I'm really excited today to talk to you about fluid resuscitation, friend or foe. Of course, you can see here all of my digits and my email as well as the connection to my YouTube channel where there's over 80 videos that you can watch for free. And so, to begin, I want to try to convince you that in trauma resuscitation, fluid is both a friend and a foe, and that you really have to have a target for your fluid resuscitation. That's what we talk about when we think of goal-directed resuscitation, and that always to remember that in the ambulance and in the emergency department, you might not be thinking about the aggressive fluid resuscitation that you're administering, but I guarantee you, it will eventually creep into the interstitium, and that's a big problem. I really hope we can learn to treat fluid as a drug by considering both its benefits and its deficits, and by remembering that a toxic cumulative effect occurs when we volume overload our patients in aggressive resuscitation. So by the way, no one is saying don't resuscitate trauma. Of course, when there's trauma, we will resuscitate. The goals of resuscitation, number one, we all know that in trauma, is to control the bleeding if we can find it and if we can do it. And then to restore the lost blood volume, bountiful in its oxygen carrying capacity and beautiful for its component of the cardiac output and most particularly the stroke volume. And in order for us to regain tissue and organ perfusion and function, we must resuscitate. Now, we make two big choices in trauma resuscitation. First, crystalloid resuscitation. Now, the problem with crystalloid resuscitation is that it does not increase oxygen carrying capacity. And as we give crystalloids, we increase the hydrostatic pressure in all of our vessels, which of course will force, force fluid creep. So it really should and it does, at some level, increase the stroke volume. And if it increases the stroke volume, then you'll have some benefit in oxygen delivery. But remember, not oxygen carrying capacity. Now, when we think about MTP, most of us in trauma, we believe in MTP very greatly because it resuscitates patients effectively. It does actually increase oxygen carrying capacity, but in in perpetuity as patients go into the intensive care unit, we'll see that it actually does create a nephrotoxic burden and that unless we are very cautious about administering whole blood with all of its components, we can initiate an increase in oxygen carrying capacity, but a deficit in oxygen download because of the absence of the enzyme that facilitates the release of oxygen now, when we are resuscitating in trauma, typically our targets are early on mean arterial pressure or systolic pressure. And I'd like to remind you that systolic pressure is a reflection of left ventricular ejection of volume into the arteries. Now, we look at a lot of different targets for systolic blood pressure depending on the kind of trauma that you have endured. 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury for penetrating injury, 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury for blunt trauma without head injury, and a bit higher for blunt trauma with traumatic brain injury. Now, does this target actually help or harm our organs when we are using fluid to get to those target points? So some will say that this leads to fluid over resuscitation, but of course, we must also be careful not to under resuscitate with fluid because then we have a diminished blood flow and again, we'll put our organs at risk. So really important to remind ourselves that it's perfusion, not just pressure. And we're so fortunate in, in hospital that we can look at things like base deficit, 
which is a real-time right now measure of the presence or absence of metabolic acidosis. So just please remember, when base is in deficit, metabolic acid is in excess. Base deficit, metabolic acid in excess. And that's metabolic, not respiratory. So that gives us a very good indicator of whether or not we've resuscitated perfusion. Now the first thing that we lose in depth of shock is perfusion to the extremities. So hands and feet are typically cold. Then we lose some perfusion to the torso and ultimately, if not resuscitated effectively, we'll, we'll lose perfusion to the heart and brain. And of course, we don't ever want to see that happen. So a beautiful visual that's from uh, trauma, initial resuscitation and assessment just reminds us of what happens as we actually fall into the depths of shock when we're losing or reducing perfusion to the heart and brain. And of course, we want to do everything we can to avoid that. So we think back about our blood pressure goals, our base deficit goals, and then we are also going to encourage some perfusion goals because that will help us a lot when we're looking at fluid resuscitation in trauma. Now, first and foremost, I want to introduce to you that fluid is your foe. It's your friend too, but it can also be a significant enemy. When we use immediate aggressive fluid resuscitation in our trauma patients and we think about our history, that was always the standard approach to try to restore volume, to try to maintain organ perfusion, saving the organs, saving our, the essential components of our organs, the heart, the brain, and in this situation, most likely the diaphragm, oxygen dependent organs, and putting all other organs in a secondary category. But what we have learned, of course, is that aggressive fluid resuscitation can disrupt the clots that form to reduce the loss of blood and to protect us from increasing hemorrhagic shock. So that's a really important perspective that actually underlies the perspective of perhaps permissive hypotension. Now, having permissive hypotension is not the same as maintaining a stroke volume. It's just allowing the vessels to be a little more dilated so there's, there's not forceful pressure driving clot loss. The other thing is that when we treat our trauma patients with large crystalloid volumes, that leads to an injury associated with resuscitation that is all about fluid creep. And that fluid creep, meaning fluid leaves the vascular bed and goes into the interstitium, really interferes with our organ function and can present with cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, uh, abdominal hypertension, and ultimately abdominal compartment syndrome, which will significantly affect the blood flow dynamic to those organs that reside in the abdominal vault. And one of the most important things that we see here is kidney injury. And kidney injury is something I'm going to focus on because it's the canary of multi-organ dysfunction and trauma resuscitation, and indeed in almost every type of resuscitation. The other thing to remember about fluid as your foe is that when we are resuscitating you and increasing your hydrostatic pressure, we are also ultimately causing some hypothermia. And uh, when we're talking about patients with aggressive resuscitation, with uh, MTP and aggressive crystalloid resuscitation, what we will often see is that with our aggressive resuscitation, the patient will become coagulopathic partly because we're diluting the blood, partly because they are consuming their platelet um, and other components in consumptive coagulopathy. But very important to remember, because they are in shock, they are hypothermic, and they also have induced hypocalcemia, which as we all know is contributory to the triad of dysfunction that we see in a, a significant traumatic and hemorrhagic injury. But the other thing that's really important, just to remind you here, is that your patient will be progressing with a metabolic acidosis. And sometimes that becomes confounded and confused with non-anion gap metabolic acidosis that's been induced by the fluid that we use for resuscitation. More on that in just a moment. Again, I want to remind you, that as you dilute the blood, you increase the hydrostatic pressure, and that promotes fluid creep, which then causes venous congestion. Not in the moment you're resuscitating, 
but hours later. And as that patient moves to the intensive care unit, there becomes a whole nother battle to save their life. So one of the most important things that I like to talk about with fluid resuscitation is when we talk about that increasing hydrostatic pressure and also the inflammatory cascade that occurs after traumatic injury is a destruction of the lining of the blood vessel. That lining of the blood vessel is known as the glycocalyx. So as we see destruction of the lining of the blood vessel, again, you're going to exacerbate that fluid creep and the venous congestion. Now the patient looks arterially hypovolemic. However, he has interstitial volume load, venous volume overload. And as this cascade continues with inflammatory cytokines and volume resuscitation, we are gonna promote more and more and more damage to the endothelium, the glycocalyx. So just something to remember, don't necessarily use the term glycocalyx in discussion with your providers. Don't really use it as dinner conversation, but it is something that needs to be in your mind every time you're resuscitating your patients. So that brings us to the question, how much fluid should we give? It's really confusing when our patient becomes wet from vascular leak syndrome, from loss of the glycocalyx. And although they may look like the Michelin man, 12 hours, 48 hours in the ICU, they may still be profoundly intraarterially volume depleted, which is our whole purpose to begin fluid resuscitation anyway, to resuscitate their arteries. Now, how will you know? How can you tell if a patient still needs fluid? Well, I'm gonna give you today's answer. Today's answer may not be tomorrow's and it wasn't yesterday's. The answer is stroke volume resuscitation correlated with evaluation of the base deficit. Two simple things that are quite easy for us to do in today's intensive care unit and even in the ED and ultimately even in the truck. We may be able to do a better, more finite job of volume resuscitation. Now remember I said the kidney is your canary. It's the canary of your organs. And the reason is we look at all of this inflammatory mediation, all of the medications that patients are receiving, particularly nephrotoxic agents like aminoglycosides and other uh, very destructive nephrotoxic agents destroying the lining of the tubules of the kidney. And then we think about what actually happens to our patient. We start to see a reduction in their ability to filter at the glomerulus so that, that we see that as a rise in the serum creatinine and a reduction in the urine output. But in addition to that, we have to consider the hypoperfusion of the kidney. When we have a low stroke volume, and also when we have fluid creep causing venous congestion, which now when it accumulates in the largest space in the human body, the abdominal vault, compresses both the renal veins and the renal arteries and putting your kidney at risk. So one of the most important perspectives is keeping your eye on the correlates of venous congestion, stroke volume, and kidney indicators. The best ones you can, the best ones you have. So very important to appreciate the kidneys at risk and trauma. In trauma, acute kidney injury has been reported at 50% of patients who get admitted to an ICU. It prolongs the length of stay and significantly increases their mortality. And these patients who progress to a post-traumatic renal failure requiring CRT demonstrate a mortality of, 40, uh, of almost 40%. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a CRT fan, but my number one goal is to reduce the utilization of CRT because we're doing a better job of resuscitating our kidney. Now, that's really important. Now, we have a lot of risk factors in trauma patients. They come to us in hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock. They're hypoperfused. They have significant extremity trauma, which is quite highly correlated to acute kidney injury. They may also have been found down and they have rhabdomyolysis. So now they're flooding their kidney with something that normally is steady state, and that would be creatinine. They're also flooding their kidney with something that's nephrotoxic, and that would be iron from their muscle lysis. Their age, their comorbidities in this day and age, 
Many of even our young patients are have comorbidities such as morbid obesity, smoking, alcohol use, and other substance abuse, as well as the older patient who might have heart disease, heart failure, diabetes, hypertension. So we have to think about all of that together, putting our kidney at risk after traumatic injury. Now that pathology of trauma-related AKI is acute tubular necrosis. Acute tubular necrosis means destruction of the tube. Destruction of the tube, that occurs because we have prolonged hypotension, prolonged hypoperfusion, and also the added effect of renal poisoning from hemoglobin and from a high level of uh, acid presentation. So what's really important to remember is looking at the kidney to tell us about resuscitation along with base deficit and stroke volume will give us a canary about multi-system organ involvement pulmonary, cardiac, neurologic, immunologic, and GI. But really importantly for most of us is the very early expression of fluid resuscitation or fluid-induced pulmonary edema. As soon as you see the appearance of pulmonary edema on a chest x-ray after resuscitation from trauma, you should always be thinking about the correlate acute kidney injury. So our culprits here are actually shock and unfortunately are MTP. Again, because we're resuscitating patients with blood, there's some hemolysis, there's degradation, there's a citrate presentation, which then promotes hypocalcemia. As you all remember that the citrate in PAC cells actually binds the calcium, making your patient hypocalcemic. So it's a catch-22 and it's very hard to grab a hold of this and try to stop that degradation of shock. Now, a couple things that are important is to recognize AKI because we really need to have a classification and a definition that we all agree on. And there's three basic classifications, but the one we're going to focus on is the one in the center, and that's the acute kidney injury network. Rifle criteria, which is renal risk, injury failure, loss, and end stage, really important, but typically it's a seven-day evaluative and CADECO guidelines, kidney, uh, uh, kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Group, that, that also is a really important tool. But I want to talk about the one that's going to be the most important to us at the bedside. And that would be, I'm so sorry, that would be the Aiken Guidelines, recognizing an increase in creatinine, just an increase of 1.5. So if you came in with 0.4 and increased to 0.6, tells you you've got a patient who's at risk. And a reduction in urine output, and urine output, remember, is a weight-based measurement, and we always have to think about it as an average over time, initially starting with six hours, looking at mLs per kilogram per hour. So averaged over six hours, and then divided by the patient's weight looking at urine output in milligram, milliliters per kilogram per hour, remembering that you always want to see a urine output of greater than 0.5 mLs per kg per hour. Now, don't get muddied here because if you've got rhabdo, you're going to have high output renal, uh, renal dysfunction. You're going to have a lot of urine, but it's not good urine. You have diabetes insipidus. You're going to have a lot of urine but it's not good urine. So it isn't just the urine alone, it's also related to the increasing serum creatinine. Now I again wanna remind you about that kidney at risk and trauma, that all of the inflammatory mediators, the lysis of blood, the medications, the fluid, significantly and profoundly affects renal perfusion, and renal perfusion ultimately affects the oxygenation delivered to the tubules of the kidney. And once you have acute kidney injury, you will see an expanded dysfunction of all the other important organs that we're talking about here. And really important to remember that once you have acute kidney injury, you're going to have fluid overload in every one of those organs. We don't see those organs quite as well. We look at the lungs and we look at the kidney, but we're not really thinking about the fluid overload in the brain unless you had a head injury. We're not really thinking about the fluid overload in the heart. We're assuming if you have venous engorgement and I do a pocus and your veins are not compressible, you have adequate volume. But the, if you have high volume in the vein and the interstitium, 
That is volume that is not in your arteries. And it's only the volume in the arteries that actually is going to sustain and maintain our organs. So, in an expansive perspective, beyond the initial trauma is the kidney at risk and critical care. Kidney injury occurs in 12% of all hospital admissions and over 50% of patients in the ICU. That's a significant factor. Almost, almost 35%, some of the newer data is saying about 35% of critical patients experience at least one episode of acute kidney injury during the course of their illness and their stay in the intensive care unit. It's common and it's associated with a poor prognosis. So thinking about trauma, thinking about critical care, thinking about what we may be able to do and reminding ourselves that we're grateful for the process of continuous renal replacement therapy, but once that is introduced, mortality rises to 80%. So if we can avoid it by doing a more focused fluid resuscitation, never withholding fluid if your patient needs it, but never giving it if your patient does not, that is going to be really important. That converts a foe into a friend, and that's what we wanna do. So again, just thinking about those unified and scientific definitions, thinking about the Aiken guidelines that tell us that we need to be very aware of increasing creatinine and not by the laboratory diagnosis which says greater than two or greater than four, but by a percent of increase. And actually we can just say one and a half times increase in your baseline creatinine means that you are at risk for acute kidney injury. Now I wanna just bring this to a simple drawing that I've made to just remind you that the blood flow that comes into the glomerulus, which is the filter of the kidney, is delivered through the afferent arterial and it is dependent on volume and pressure. That blood that comes in there is dirty, dilute, electrolyte rich, and typically in a trauma or critically ill patient, relatively poorly oxygenated. So what happens when we have shock, when we have hemorrhage, is we have reduced blood flow and reduced blood pressure driving that filtration. So as we have a reduction in that blood flow, so will we have a reduction in the outflow of blood which is what actually provides oxygen to the tubules of the kidney. So again, we think about hypoperfusion, inflammation, neuroendocrine response, critical illness, shock, traumatic injury, all mechanisms that are gonna impair renal perfusion. And then we switch over to the other side and we say that poor blood flow, blood volume, blood pressure is going to actually affect significantly the tubules of the kidney where the work of making urine and keeping blood perfect is done. So what is actually gonna happen is our blood that enters possibly into the kidney and that exits from the kidney does not have a clear purpose. And what ends up happening is we infarct the tubules, we infarct the glomerulus, our urine output drops, our glomerular filtration rate drops, and our serum creatinine increases. And what we want to remember at the bedside is the importance of hourly accurate INO. So we can always keep an eye on decreasing urine output and being aware that as we resuscitate, we should see an improvement. So the issue is that when we start to see a decreased urine output and a decrease in creatinine clearance and glomerular filtration rate, most of us will just say an increase in serum creatinine. Typically, we're going to say, let's give some more fluid. And we're gonna give that fluid whether the patient really needs it or not. So I want you to make fluid your friend. First and foremost, I want you to think about the type of fluids you're using, okay? Now I'm not talking about blood products. We have to use MTP. We have to resuscitate with blood when patients have been in hemorrhagic shock or hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock. I wanna talk about resuscitation fluids with crystalloid. So we know that over the last 10 years, there's been so much discussion about resuscitation with balanced balanced crystalloid or balanced solutes seems to have a, a significant effect, but not well-founded, not well-proven, but from a perspective and from observation seems to have a significant beneficial effect on renal outcome compared with sodium chloride. And in particular, in the context of muscle lysis. So really, really important to understand that both fluid overload and fluid composition 
can affect your kidneys and your kidneys are the canaries of your other organs. Now, unbalanced crystalloid is isotonic saline. That means when I administer it, it separates into sodium and chloride. Unbalanced crystalloid, normal saline, actually appears to reduce actual renal perfusion and actually cause some renal injury from hyperchloremia. So very important to recognize that unbalanced sodium chloride, which is 0.9% or any other sodium chloride that you're giving, it's unbalanced because of the dissociation and the presence of chloride, causes kidney injury and may increase significantly acidosis, non-GAP. Now due to that risk, the idea should be that we should utilize chloride liberal fluids. Those are what we should be utilizing. Those balanced electrolytes cause less hyperchloremia, less metabolic acidosis, and are preferred. In general, that first agent of choice for us will be lactated ringers. Lactated ringers causes less inflammation, it actually causes less immune dysfunction, and it also can increase the buffering aspect of your base. So it's really quite a wonderful agent for early and initial resuscitation. Now I want you to look at this visual that is, again, about trying to target the endothelium. We do know that 0.9 normal saline may actually cause more endothelial and glycocalyx dysfunction. But also really important to recognize that when we're talking about fluid resuscitation, I just want you to have this nice little comparative analysis looking at sodium chloride, which has sodium at 154 and chloride at 154, and per liter is around 5.5 pH, okay? Moving to lactated ringers, sodium 130, chloride 109, and with a pH of 6.5. Four. And then moving to plasma light. I wish it was called plasma like. Plasma light is not a human recombinant variable. It is just an isotonic crystalloid designed to look more like plasma. So it has a sodium of 140 and a chloride of 98, has potassium, doesn't have any calcium, but has a pH of around 7.0. Now, those costs you see at the bottom, those are older costs. That is not what your hospital has negotiated. Typically, what we say now is saline, lactated ringers around $2 to $4, and plasmolite might be $20 to $60, depending on your hospital contract. So everybody's a little cautious about giving plasmolite because it's more expensive, but it is much more like the pH of your plasma with much more similarity in terms of electrolytes. The other thing is to make fluid your friend by finding the right target. Over and over and over again, the discussion is fluid administration is beneficial only if it increases stroke volume. So there are many ways that we talk about this. We talk about pulse pressure variation. We talk about passive leg raise testing. We talk about stroke volume variation. We talk about change in stroke volume or change in stroke volume over change in CVP. These are all target points. I'm not saying anyone is more right than the other, but in my practice and in the current literature, the most important thing is finding a way to measure stroke volume. Stroke volume is an indicator of the ventricular acceptance of volume and ejection of that volume. That's what people traditionally call fluid responsive, but they forgot that the chalice for accepting fluid is the ventricle. And when you have inflammatory injury, you may have traumatic injury to the heart, you may have had some ischemic changes, just pure inflammation can reduce ventricular efficiency so that when you give volume, it doesn't actually get ejected forward, it stays in the veins and creeps into the interstitium. And again, I wanna remind you, the other aspect here is perhaps a little bit of permissive hypotension can actually improve outcomes as well. So stroke volume and perhaps some permissive hypotension. And when you have unwieldy hypotension, because that's going to be unacceptable as well, perhaps consideration of low-dose, well-managed vasopressors. And I underscore low-dose. So why do we give volume? We give volume for one reason only to increase your stroke volume. If it doesn't increase your stroke volume, then the volume we've given you is of no benefit and it's going to be harmful because of its venostasis 
and the fluid creep. So just in case you don't remember about stroke volume, stroke volume is actually end diastolic volume, the volume at the end of filling, minus the end systolic volume, the volume left in the ventricle at end of ejection. That's what tells us about ventricular efficiency. And when we talk about stroke volume at the bedside, it's a poor man's tool of looking at ejection fraction. Now, it would be a big mistake for you to say, hey, this is a 20-year-old guy. When he first came in, we did an echo. We had an ejection fraction of 65%. Four days later, he's got venous engorgement. He has interstitial edema. He has ARDS. He has abdominal hypertension. But he had a great heart. Yeah, the key word there is had. Ejection fraction is the best way for you to measure ventricular efficiency. And in patients who are deteriorating after resuscitation, we need to do an ejection fraction measurement again. But also at the bedside, something we control is the ability to evaluate stroke volume. And when we're evaluating stroke volume, that can give us a significant amount of information that tells us about efficacy of resuscitation. So through the eyes of Frank and Starling, we, who were two doctors who said, if you fill the ventricular chamber and it's nice and compliant, stretch it out, it will recoil in ejection. And so Frank and Starling really talked about volume load and stroke volume, volume load and ejection. We don't look at volume. We have a problem. We can't really look at volume. So what we're going to look at is the volume in the right ventricle, which will be reflected in our central venous pressure, which is most significantly affected by changes in compliance. And we're going to correlate CVP to stroke volume. So if I've got a patient with a central line, I'm not, I am not, and I'm going to say it again, I am not monitoring central venous pressure to tell me about volume. I'm monitoring central venous pressure to tell me about the response of the ventricle to the volume load. As CVP goes up, my ventricle is becoming less responsive. As my ventricle becomes less responsive, I'm going to have venostasis and interstitial volume load. I'm not using CVP as a volume indicator. I'm using it to tell me about compliance. If I give you volume and your CVP goes up, I need to see that that increased CVP actually reflects as an increased stroke volume because that tells me whether or not your ventricle can accept and eject the volume. Fantastic. This is the way that we have a method to measure response to volume. POCUS is great, ECHO is great, but at the bedside, we need something to constantly tell us what is the effect of volume? What is the effect of vasopressor? What is the effect of inotrope? We want to be sure that we are always improving stroke volume and never limiting it. We want to improve your stroke volume. That's the way you make fluid your friend. So just remember, this is a basic parameter for evaluating the ejection from your heart and the ability of the heart to accept volume. So by the way, initial volume resuscitation, you do what you need, 20, 30 mLs per kilogram. But as soon as you've done an initial volume resuscitation, you need to now optimize the volume you're giving. And you're going to focus that on stroke volume. That, that's my perspective and the perspective of many trauma surgeons and hemodynamicists worldwide. Because any myocardium that is functional will maintain stroke volume along a given volume. You can give volume, you'll maintain stroke volume. You give more volume, you maintain stroke volume. You give more volume, the stroke volume decreases or doesn't increase, enough volume has been given. So that's really what we're doing when we talk about our Frank Starling curve. Now I'm going to put that into even simpler terms with my simple cartoon here. Any volume that I give in your veins, whether it's central, peripheral, it doesn't matter, right atria, any volume given there must always end up in the artery. So best case scenario, stroke volume. Second best, systolic pressure. But stroke volume is better because it tells me about ventricular acceptance and ventricular efficiency. Now, one of the things we can do is test your ventricle. We can do that with a fluid challenge by raise, sitting you up at 45 degrees, then laying you flat and raising your legs at 45 degrees. This is known as a passive leg raise. I've never done it in a trauma patient. Never will, I'm sure, do it in a trauma patient. Instead, I talk about aliquots of fluid. So remember, you've done your initial resuscitation, but now I'm testing whether or not you need more fluid. You're still unstable. You're tachycardic. You might be mildly to moderately hypotensive. I've added a vasopressor. I need to know whether or not you're going to need more fluid.
So I'm going to give you an aliquot. An aliquot means the smaller amount of fluid, 250 to 500. I'm typically going to do that relatively quickly in less than five minutes. And here's what I'm going to do. I want to test if that volume infusion actually improved your end diastolic volume, but I can't measure that. So I'm going to look at your CVP. And I want to see a slow rate of rise or no rate of rise, rise here. But what I actually want to see is that that aliquot of fluid increase your stroke volume 10%. Now stroke volume maybe when we started was 40, so that's only an increase of 4 mLs. It's not significant, but it does tell me that the patient could accept the volume I gave and eject it. And every single patient and every intervention deserves you, for you to actually plot or think about a Frank Starling curve. So just to remind you, kidney at risk, the canary of your organs, Look at stroke volume, look at base deficit, look at heart rate, look at MAP, look at systolic pressure, and remember, cautious fluids after initial resuscitation, cautious fluids, and target stroke volume. This is a way that we can help our patients to overcome the low stroke volume and venous congestion, which are actually causing significant organ deficit. We saved you from your injury but you die in critical care. We saved you, but you die. Let's see what we can do by targeting our stroke volume and being cautious with fluid administration. Make fluid your friend, not your foe. I hope I've convinced you that in trauma resuscitation, fluid is both friend and foe, but I want it to be more friendly. Direct your therapy towards a target. Pick a target, stay with it. MAP may not be the best target. Systolic pressure, stroke volume, base deficit, kidney indicators. These are all meaningful and assist us in the continuous resuscitation of patients after initial resuscitation. And then to remind ourselves that if we over resuscitate patients, we will have a tendency to see fluid accumulation or fluid creep into the interstitium venous congestion, and a further reduction in arterial blood flow. Remember, fluid's a drug, and it has toxic cumulative effects, just like any other drug. Always be aware that fluid is both friend and foe, and try to keep it on the friendly side. I've so enjoyed being with you today. I'm very, very happy to say that I will be available live on the panel for question and answer because I have gotten through security after returning from Paris where I spoke at the European Intensive Care Meeting. Thank you very much. You see here my email and my YouTube channel, and I want to congratulate you for all the excellent work you do and are continuing to do in trauma resuscitation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.